Good afternoon. My name is Mandy Galanti from the New Jersey Kick, and I will be your moderator for today's event, Achieving Cyber Resilience, Best Practices and Resources for Public Sector Partners. Welcome. Okay, this is our agenda for today, just an eyeball of it. Our first speaker is Anthony Zissimos from the CISA, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Welcome, Tony. And we're going to give you the floor and let you take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. As Manny said, my name is Anthony Zismos with CISA. And uh, so one thing I'd like to start off with off the bat is uh, you're talking about, you know, the, uh, the different things that keep you up at night as far as uh, cyber. One thing we can help with is that funding piece, because everything you're going to see that I'm offering here today is absolutely free to you. Is paid through tax dollars and the services are provided at no cost to you. So I think everybody should be able to uh, be able to fit what you see here into your budget with no issues. Uh, next slide, please. So I am with CISA. As you can see here, our vision is to secure the infrastructure for the American people. And we partner with uh, industry and government to help uh, manage that risk. And we have two goals. Um, our first one is the defend today, and that's more of our tactical level, like with folks myself on the ground and the secure tomorrow, that's more of our strategic outlook as we look to, uh, to strengthen our infrastructure and as we look at the uh, long-term uh, issues that we're facing. Uh, all you have to do is open up a newspaper any day and you know exactly what I'm talking about. We're under some kind of constant threat and uh, the threats are constantly evolving, so we need to evolve with that also. Next slide, please. So I am a cybersecurity advisor, which means I am kind of uh, boots on the ground for CISA. We are located throughout the country and I am here in New Jersey. So when you call me, you're talking to somebody who's stationed or not stationed, uh, resides here in New Jersey and uh, I am just a phone call away. And some of the things that we look to do as part of the cybersecurity advisor program is to assess, promote, build, educate, listen, and coordinate. So we help evaluate critical infrastructure cyber risks through some of our assessments that we do. We help, uh, you know, encourage best practices and to help uh, mitigate risks. Uh, we, we have a plethora of information out on CISA.gov that you can download that helps with a lot of this stuff. Uh, we try to build, develop capacity and support cyber communities of interest in working groups. This is a perfect example. This is a great place for us that the NJ Kick has set up to get our word out and to make our services available. Because uh, unfortunately, a lot of people still don't know who we are and, and what we can offer them. And with that, we also try to educate, uh, raise awareness. Uh, things that we see in the IT industry that we think is common knowledge really isn't. And that's why it's important for these forums that we get the word out and let people know what's going on and, and some of the things they should be doing. Uh, we also try to listen to our stakeholders to, to collect more requirements for them. Um, you, you all in the field see a lot more things than we do. So it, it's good to have that two-way communication where you let us know some of the things you're seeing and where you may need help. And finally, we try to coordinate. We can. Uh, coordinate with incident support. Now myself, I don't personally come out and do any type of incident support. I don't have a kit in the back of my car where I'm gonna show up and kick you off your terminal and start working. But I can bring federal resources to bear needed, whether it's uh, US Secret Service, uh, coordinating with the FBI, Homeland Security investigators, uh, even coordinating with the NJ kick for a, for a local response. We all kind of work together and the, uh, to, to, to help you through your, um, through your incidents. And we, we catalog all those lessons learned to hopefully um, make the responses quicker and better as we go along. Uh, next slide, please. So it says that we focus on critical infrastructure. So there are 16 sectors and you could see which one uh, CISA is a lead for. And that doesn't mean that we don't uh, help with all of them, just means that we're responsible for those, but uh, we work across all, all uh, government agencies and we work together to try to make everything uh, uh, as secure as possible. So these 16, they're considered vital to the United States that their capacitation or destruction would have an effect on our security, economic security, uh, public health or safety to our nation. So this is our, our focus. And again, uh, just open up any newspaper and I'm sure you'll find a story related to, to one of these sectors and some type of issue that they're having. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, next I'd like to discuss some of our resources that we have available. So we have them like national resources and regional resources. The regional resources are the ones that are offered uh, by me here, specifically in, in New Jersey. Uh, and those are the, uh, the assessments that we do. 
And those are the cyber resilience reviews, external dependencies management, and critical infrastructure surveys. Now, these reviews, we're not regulatory. Uh, so any information that we share is just between you and I. We can't be Oprah, we can't be subpoenaed, uh, we can't be FOIA'd, uh, none of those. It's, it's a, a confidentiality agreement that we sign between the stakeholder and ourselves that the information won't be shared. You can share it with whoever you want, but they will never get it from us. And some of our national resources are mission campaigns, tabletop exercises, vulnerability scanning, web application scanning, remote penetration testings. Now, those are all conducted from uh, CISA Central, which is our operations center back in DC. And like I said, the other ones are where I would actually come in and physically sit down with you. Uh, next slide, please. First one up is the uh, Cyber Resilience Review. So this is an interview-based assessment. We evaluate an organization's operational resilience and their cybersecurity practices. It's derived from the CERT resilience management model, and it, um, we look at the maturity of an organization's cap capabilities and uh, capacities in performing, planning, managing, measuring, and defining cybersecurity cap uh, capabilities across 10 domains. And if you go to the next slide, uh, do we have the uh, 10 domains there? Next slide, please. Or actually, uh, next one. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I moved too far ahead. I'm sorry, go back one. So these are the 10 domains that we're looking at. Asset management, configuration change management, control, central dependencies, incident management, risk management, service continuity management, situational awareness, training and awareness, and volume management. And again, this is an interview based. We don't look at logs. Anything you tell us, we're gonna take you at your word. It's we do it, we don't do it, or we partially do it. And that's the way that the, um, uh, that the assessment is run, a question and answer session. Next slide, please. So the other uh, assessment that we do is the external dependencies management. And there we look at your, as the thing uh, states, your dependencies on your uh, external partners. Uh, a lot of folks these days, it's not just what they're running on their own network, but also what they're, uh, you know, who they're partnering with. So some of the things that we look there is that uh, form relationship, manage relationship, monitor and improve. So with the, we look at how the organization looks at third party risks, how they select their internal uh, entities and how they form those relationships so that the risk hopefully is managed from the start. We also look at that ongoing relationship uh, for support and strength over those critical services and how they're managed and how they manage both risk and costs. And then finally, uh, you know, how the organization plans for and then manages disruptions or incidents related to external entities. As we know, a lot of these things are a domino effect. Uh, a, a shortfall of your, um, of your, in your supply chain is, is an issue for yourself. Uh, so what we're trying to do is get ahead of this so that the, um, that folks uh, think about these things as they build their service level agreements with their, with their external dependencies to make sure that all of these are addressed. For instance, if uh, your, your supplier had a ransomware incident and you have a direct connection, they have a direct connection in your network, is that gonna impact your network where now you're compromised also? Would they notify you that something happened so that you could sever that connection until it's resolved? So these are the kind of things you need to look at as you're working with these external agencies. Next slide, please. So the cyber, uh, the cyber security infrastructure survey, it's not so much a report, uh, it's more, uh, it's, you get a dashboard and the next slide will show you an example of what that kind of looks like. But we look at it into, in five different categories here, cybersecurity forces, controls, incident response, dependencies, and, uh, and, and management. And as we're looking at these, again, it's, it's to help look at your, uh, your um, critical services and are you doing certain things that you should be doing. Uh, next slide, please. And from there, instead of a report, you actually get a dashboard where you can kind of see based on yourself, uh, you would be that blue line, and then you'd see the, the low end of the, um, of the responses, the high end, and then the median as far as are people doing these same type of things. And then you could look at that thread overlay up top and the scenario where you could actually kind of change the scenarios in some of the situations. And it will let you know that if you modified some of these things, would it actually increase or decrease your, your, uh, your protection resiliency index, which we look at to see how well you're doing things. Next slide, please. So phishing campaign, this is run out of our, uh, out of our operation center. And as it, as it states, it's just like anywhere else. We, we send phishing emails out and we have different complexity levels, uh, anywhere from um, 
hey, you just want an Apple, Apple iPad, please click here to something that would be something more to your line of work. Like, please open up this document and look at the uh, business proposal, make sure everything looks fine. Uh, we don't, this is through a, a, a six week engagement and uh, the results, uh, next slide please. This is kind of something that you'll get back. It'll, take, it'll tell you the click rate, how many were sent out, and also by the complexity of the email, how many people clicked on it. This doesn't show any names or, or who clicked on it. It just gives you a click rate for, for you to, for some analysis to see how your training is going. Next slide. So cyber exercises and planning. Uh, they, we do everything from the uh, national level, uh, as you can see to the very bottom there, exercise in a box and everywhere in between. These tabletop exercises I find very handy because there's a lot of, you, you sit down and there's no actual anybody doing any any like physical work or not, uh, you know, bringing servers down or anything like this, but just walking through scenarios to see like if something happens, you know, what would you do? And it, it, it's a really good place where people can kind of sit in a room together and, and go through these steps because the time to figure out how to respond in an incident is not when the incident happens. There should be some kind of plan in place where as you're looking at these things, uh, you, you kind of have an idea what you should be doing and uh, how to catalog that and how to do your lessons learned so that you can, you know, make it better the next time around. And again, uh, we, we were doing them uh, just virtually. I think they started to do them back in person again. But uh, my understanding is everything's going back to Virgil with the uh, with uh, the Delta variant right now. But it's run off of uh, Adobe Connect and they have the slides and all the notes right up there and all the documentations and people dial in and you can and, and do a virtual tabletop exercise. Next slide, please. So our vulnerability scanning service is something everybody should be taking advantage on. So we look at all your uh, internet accessible systems. Uh, so uh, if it's a public facing IP address, we could scan it. And again, it's nothing different than anybody who has the proper tools would be able to scan. So we're looking at it from the adversary perspective. If they're out there just looking looking for, for uh, targets of opportunity and they, and they scan your network with the type of stuff they would find. And you would get a weekly report letting them know, letting you know what we found. And again, this is just between you and the people that send the report. It's not sent anybody else, it's not shared. Nobody's gonna follow up with you and say, you haven't fixed these vulnerabilities, what are you doing? So it's, uh, it, it's a great another tool. Whether or not you have a service from somewhere else, it doesn't hurt to sign up. Because uh, it's good, maybe you, you check what uh, CISA finds versus somebody else who you're paying for to, to see how they kind of compare and if they're seeing the same kind of uh, vulnerabilities. Next slide, please. Along with that, we have the web application scanning where they look at your um, publicly accessible websites to, to, for known vulnerabilities. Again, uh, you know, some, some of you folks are paying for that service, but it's another free service that can be incorporated. And you, you could use the web application service only if you've signed up for the uh, cyber hygiene for the vulnerability scanning. This, this one is not standalone. So they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, next slide. And remote penetration testing. Again, this is we're looking at the uh, public facing IP addresses and we try to uh, get inside your network from those uh, locations just as an adversary would. We also have an phishing assessment that goes along with that, and what that that they actually work with an insider where they, they where you let the uh, email through because they want to test uh, your firewalls and some of your applications to see if they're catching these uh, malicious emails and are they alerting you or are they just getting through. So again, a lot of great resources that are um, that are available uh, for no charge, and uh, these slides I'm sure are going to be made available to you. So uh, look them over and uh, let me know if any of you are interested in any of these. Uh, next slide. So as far as federal incident response, myself, we're not investigators, kind of like the NJ kick. Uh, we, we have no legal authority to do anything. So uh, if you do have an actual incident, your best bet is called uh, the FBI or Secret Service or, or uh, and report it to, you know, IC3.gov. For ourselves, we're more on the asset side, right? We look at IOCs, we help with recovery. Uh, we, we can help with some analysis depending on, on the critical infrastructure. But again, we can't investigate in the sense of trying to find out who the bad guys are and, and why they're on your network. So uh, that's, that's on the other side. Uh, next slide. One thing you can do though, is if you have uh, a file that you are suspected or suspect it may be some malware, you can actually upload it and submit it to to CISA for, uh, for analysis and I'll get back to you and let you know if they did find anything. 
Um, and you never know, you may be the first person who is seeing something and you may be the one that helps us establish the IOCs that we send out and possibly prevent somebody else from being infected. So even if you're not 100% sure, it never hurts to get it checked. Uh, maybe nothing, maybe something. So uh, that's another service you can use there. Next slide. And that is all I have for you. Uh, I think we're going into question and answer session now, Mandy. That's right. Thank you, Tony. That was great. Um, we already have a tremendous amount of demand for our recordings and, and your documents. So clearly people want some stuff to take home. Let me get started with some questions. Um, this one I have to read word for word because I'm not sure I completely understand it. So let me bring it up. Um, is the resiliency assessment based on the NIST or ISO 2701 framework? It's based on the cybersecurity framework, but you know NIST, CIS. Uh, a lot of the questions they all come out of the all all, all those type of uh, documents. So it's uh, but again, it's not. We we're not like assessors in the sense of a regulary coming in and saying you have to do this. Like I said, when we come in, we ask the questions. We don't ask for dumping. Uh, documentation or verification. So if you're telling me you're doing X, Y, and Z, I'm going to write down you're doing X, Y, and Z. And the way that these assessments are run is, yes, we do it. No, we don't do it or we partially do it. And the uh, and your your report is based on how you answer. So what we get out of it from CISA is, uh, because again, it's no charge to you and you get the report, but we, we get to see all the data and, you know, we, we take people's names out and we, we throw all the data and we do, you know, we, we run it through to kind of see the, the health of, of that critical infrastructure sector as far as cybersecurity goes. So the report that you get back, you'd see how you kind of rate against everybody else. Now, the only data that you could see that was submitted was your own, but you'll, you'll get the, uh, you know, according to everybody else, you're kind of in the middle, you're doing better, you're doing worse. So you can kind of gauge yourself uh, as an industry how things are going. So that's, that's what CISA gets out of these reports. Excellent. Hmm. So one of the things that I think I can just generalize is what would you say is the most popular of the services that you've discussed today? What are the ones that are requested most? Uh, I'd say the uh, the ones that are kind of run remotely, the uh, the phishing, vulnerability scanning, and remote penetration testing. Uh, the assessments, those are kind of hit and miss. Um, I think people are still kind of hesitant because they're afraid that uh, – in, in the back of their head that if they if they did really bad, <laughs> it, it may cost them their job. So uh, there's there's so little s skepticism there that it's really nobody's going to look at this other than themselves. So I, I don't know if there's some resistance there to, to have somebody come in, a uh, third party of the federal government to review things. But uh, at the end of the day, it, it really doesn't make a difference to us. I, I Like I said, that report doesn't get shared with anybody. This is for your benefit. You could look at the report. You could read it. You could... You could act on it. You could throw it away. You could put it in a filing cabinet. You could, you know, you could balance a table that, you know, one leg's too short. You could throw the report under there so your table is uh, straight. It, it, it doesn't make a difference to us what, what you do. Um, it, it, it's to help you all. This is one of the few places in the government where I truly believe when we say we're here to help, we are because we, we gain nothing. We're not trying to sell you anything. I'm not going to come and do an assessment and say, you know, I could sell you this service to make you more resilient to, to cyber attacks. It, that's, that's not what we do. We just want secure America to make, you know, everybody's life a little easier. Okay. So I, assuming that you've sold everybody, how long would it take if I put in a request for some of these services? Like what's, what would be a lead time? So it, it depends. So the, um, those assessments, the uh, CRR, EDM, CIS are done locally. So it's a matter of calling me up and we schedule because there is some preliminary work that we have to do before, you know, I just don't show up. We just, you know, some forms we've got to fill out and make sure everything's ready to go before um, I show up. But, you know, that's usually with, within a, a two, three, four weeks, we could probably from the time we schedule it to the time I'm there. Uh, the vulnerability scanning, you, you submit something today by next week or the following week, you're going to start getting your weekly reports and they'll keep coming until you stop. Uh, the penetration testing and the phishing assessments, there may be a few week uh, lag time again, because, you know, you, you, we got to get folks in the queue until um, there, there's only so many of us doing these. So things got to get scheduled out a while. Same with the uh, with the exercise and planning. That, and that's the beauty of something like the exercise in the box. If it's something you need immediately, you could go out to CISA.gov to the exercise page and just start downloading things from there where you can run your own tabletop exercise. 
Okay, this is great. We're almost out of time. So I'm going to move us along. But just so you know, there was a request to post your email address again. Um, and so your email address is, was, was, you know, sent out to the chat. And sure. just a question on that. So if these requests come into your office, do they go directly to you, Tony? Or is it is it filtered to different people depending on what's coming in? Anything uh, that's sent to me will be filtered through me, and then I, I coordinate with uh, CISA Central back if it's something that we need to coordinate with the. Uh, so, like if you wanted a um, vulnerability scanning, I would send an email to vulnerability management team and CC the person that's requesting it, along with myself, to make sure that they actually, uh, you know, replied. And then they will send that person the forms they fill out, and then from there, I, I'm out of the picture. I don't. Like I said, I don't get any of the reports back. This is, uh, you know, it, you know, I'm out of the loop. You could share with me if you want, but nobody's going to reach out to me so and say, hey, you, you know, in reaching after, to you. Yeah. <laughs> they could look you in the face. They wouldn't be embarrassed. You never saw the report. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Love it. Okay, thank you so much. This was a You're great welcome. start to our symposium. So I'd like to welcome Rachel Farrell and Brendan Montaigne from Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center. The floor is yours. Hey, thank you so much, Mandy. And hopefully everybody's hearing me all right. Um, yes, we, we are from the MSI SEC. Uh, my name is Brendan. I'm one of the account managers here. Uh, alongside myself is my colleague, Rachel Farrell. Uh, another account manager uh, for you. Uh, our contact information is up on the screen. It'll also be at the end of the presentation. Uh, but I do just really quickly uh, want to say thank you to Tony. That was an awesome presentation. We work very, very closely with CISA uh, all the time. Uh, and thank you to the NJ Kick folks for uh, inviting us out today to, to present uh, in this virtual format. So uh, with that, I'm actually just going to pass it over to my colleague, Rachel, and let her start things off. Thank you so much, Brendan. Hopefully everyone can hear me well as well. Um, and as Brendan mentioned, we'd like to thank Tony. We, uh, we definitely uh, work closely with CISA, and I'd also as well like to thank the NJ Kick for having us today. So with that, Good afternoon, everyone. Um, hopefully my video is showing. I kind of have a little bit of video issue, but if not, it should show up quickly. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is basically our crew. The Stakeholder Engagement Account and ISAC has welcomed thousands of new members and added many new team members to our department. So I, we thought it might be nice to put some faces to names. As you can see, Brendan Montaigne, my colleague, he covers the West Coast mountain area and territories. So Brendan is your go-to guy for that navy blue section over on the West Coast. Um, our colleagues, Michelle Nolan and Nolan Emilio, take care of the great central territory. And Kyle, who it's important to know, um, if you are currently an MSI SAC member, he is your account manager for New Jersey. If you're not, he would be your account manager for New Jersey. Uh, he is the East Coast manager. And certainly they can't do it alone. So we have the team on the right-hand side to help cover all the states and territories. I am a part of that team and trust me, we are always available to help you out. And please feel free to reach out to us for any questions, any account changes, webinar invites, or even just to say hi. Um, as you can see on the bottom of the screen, there's the info at msisec.org to get you connected with your account manager or simply to ask about how you may become a member of the MSISAC. Next slide, please. Uh, and now comes the confusing part. I'd like to note that although we at the MSISAC have been designated by DHS as a key resource for cyber threat prevention, protection, response, and recovery, for all U.S. state, local, tribal, and territorial, also known as SLTT governments, we are not the federal government, but we are funded by DHS. The other designation I wanted to make is we work very closely with CISA, and we very much enjoy our collaboration with them. Next slide, please. So who do we serve? As you can see, we serve a vast amount of entities. Our membership coverage is very diverse and our goal is to help as many people as we can to take advantage of the many free services we offer. 
Just to highlight, we've got 50 state governments, 11,500 local governments, six territorial, 146 tribal, and 80 DHS recognized fusion centers. In the great state of New Jersey alone, we have 31 county borough members, 47 town townships, 115 school districts, and 351 members in New Jersey. And that's just a snapshot of who we have currently in our membership. We are constantly growing and we hope to grow much more in the upcoming months and years. Next slide, please. So value to cyber criminals. It's important to note that when it comes to what is a value, what is a value or valuable to cyber criminals, it's not just money that they're after. Information is just as, if not more valuable to them. Small organizations are targeted as well because they have personal info, social security numbers, medical records, addresses, financial information, et cetera. And that's a lot of the type of information that cyber threat actors are looking for. It's key to exercise caution should you receive any emails that look suspicious or if you feel that you're being asked for something or information that seems kind of iffy. Don't hesitate to reach out to your IT department, your CISO, whoever your company has designated as a go-to if something just doesn't quite feel right. Phishing is the number one vector in cybersecurity attacks. So basically, you are one of the top defenses to help your organization fight cybercrime. Next slide, please. So with that, what can we do about it? There are many armors of defense in fighting cyber attacks. I'm going to highlight a few here. Um, as you can see on the slide, there's, there's multiple options to have that defense. And as it's known, defense is hard, but when it's done right, it does win the game. So one of the ones I'd like to highlight is following standard best practices, like um, CIS security controls benchmark is a key step in your defense. These best practices are set up to safeguard your information and your work. Another one I'd like to highlight is multi-factor authentication for critical services. It's another great way to amp up your cyber defense. Simply put, the harder we try to protect our information and keep out outsiders, the harder it is for them to break in. Multi-factor is a great multi-step suit of armor, so to speak, in safeguarding our valuable information. And as you can see from the slide, there's definitely other forms of defense at your disposal, but the last one I'd like to highlight is well, us here at the MSI staff. What better way to utilize and, you know, basically have a plan than to take advantage of free and low cost security services? If that sounds like a good plan to you, then you should join the MSI SAC if you're not a member already. It's very easy to join. And once you are a member, you will have access to so many services that can help strengthen your cybersecurity posture. You can also schedule a virtual service review, also known as a VSR, which will help give you a really nice overview of what services may fit best for your company as well as you know what you're doing. We also have the CISA Stop Ransomware link noted as well as the CISA Ransomware Guide for your perusal and for your information. With that, I'd much like to thank you for your time today and I'd like to pass over to my colleague, Brendan Montaigne, who will cover the many benefits of MSI staff membership and other MSI staff services. Over to you, Brent. Awesome, thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, and yes, this is the slide I'm looking for. Um, so this is just a quick snapshot of some of the services that we do have to offer. Um, I, I think a couple of them got caught off or cut off. Um, in transition, but that's, that's totally all right, because I get to talk about all of them today. Uh, but with that being said, I do want to note that um, in, in favor of time, I'm, I may skip over a little bit. I must, might rush through um, a few of these slides. I am a true New Yorker. Uh, I do talk fast. So if I'm talking too quickly or, or anything, you know, feel free to put it in chat. I'll slow down a little bit. Um, I work primarily on the West Coast, as Rachel said, and uh, I've come to notice that uh, us East Coasters talk a little bit too fast for the people on the West Coast. Uh, but with that being said, I wanna highlight a few on the screen uh, before jumping right into our slides. Uh, and that is the, the very first one is our 24 by seven security operations center. Uh, I'm gonna talk about that in a second, but that is truly the heart and soul of everything that we do here at the MSI SAC. 
some other things that I'm going to highlight today is our malicious domain blocking and reporting service, or MDBR, uh, as well as some additional resources and talk very briefly about uh, some of the emails that we send. Uh, and for those of you on the call today that are members, you know how many emails we send on a daily basis, uh, or, or not daily, but uh, on a regular basis. So uh, we'll talk about those a little bit. Uh, but with that, with next slide, please. So our Security Operations Center, this is, as I mentioned, the heart and soul of the MSI SAC. Uh, all of these services that we offer, all of our emails, all of our reporting comes from our SAC. Uh, these folks are hosted uh, in upstate New York, uh, 24 by 7 by 365. Uh, so it doesn't matter if it's 2 a.m. on New Year's Day, someone's going to be in the SOC available for you to answer your call or reply to your email for whatever it may be. Uh, and our attitude is if you are questioning if what you're seeing justifies a call to the MSI SAC Security Operations Center, you already answered your question pick up the phone. We're happy to assist with pretty much anything, uh, whether you're experiencing a full-blown incident or you just have a general cybersecurity question. Uh, the main thing that I will highlight from our entire presentation today uh, is that little blue square, uh, the phone number for the Security Operations Center. Uh, it can be a lifeline for you, a second resource, whatever it may be, uh, but that 1-866-787-4722 uh, use that, write it down, put it in your incident response plan. Uh, let us assist in any way possible because that's that's our main goal. Uh, and next slide, please. Now I want to get into some of the actual services that we do have to offer. Uh, and with that, you guys saw the first screen that I had I had presented on, and it was a list of all of the services that we offer. Of course, it can be a little bit overwhelming. And the first question that we always get is, what is the first service that I should take advantage of? Or what's the first thing I should do when I become an MSI SAC member? The first thing that we always ask of our members is submit your publicly facing IPs and domains. Uh, so very similar to CISA, where they are uh, doing active monitoring of your IPs and domains, we are looking for signs of compromise or malicious activity. Uh, so we work with a few third-party vendors nationally and internationally, uh, looking to see if any of your IPs are beaconing out to sinkhole websites or previously malicious websites. Uh, if we see anything, we'll reach out to you uh, either via phone call or email, depending on how serious it is, and, and just let you know that that vulnerability is out there so you can mitigate and prevent that risk from uh, blowing up into a, a full-blown incident. We're also looking for leaked credentials. Uh, we all know that threat actors love to brag when they steal your credentials, when they're harvesting passwords and whatever it may be. Uh, so same thing. We're, we're monitoring forums, websites. Uh, we also pay for a few services. So if we see any credentials related to uh, your domains or specifically SLTT domains, we are able to see that. And we'll provide that feedback to you directly so you can Make sure your employees are updating their passwords. You don't have any leaks out there, uh, and there's no vulnerabilities on that side of the house. Next slide, please. So, so with that, of course, just submitting your IPs and domains or getting our reports or working with CISA or really any industry, it's not going to be a one, one, uh, one solution fits all. However, we have a service that's called our malicious domain blocking and reporting service that's dedicated to actively blocking malicious connections before they ever establish. Uh, so we have a, our MDBR service, which we are partnering with Akamai. Uh, and Akamai, just for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Akamai sees about a third to two thirds of the world DNS traffic on a daily basis. Uh, so they're a huge partner of ours. Uh, and we're able to provide this at completely no cost. Uh, and the idea is that it is super simple to implement. There's no hardware, no software to install. Um, and really, it only takes about 15 minutes after you become an MSI SAC member. Uh, actually, I was giving a presentation once, and it was only about a 30-minute presentation. And similar to this presentation, when I got to the MDBR slide, we actually had somebody register for MDBR contact our security operations center and get this service up and running before I even finished my presentation. 
Now, that was extremely fast, but we do like to say it takes under an hour to get MDBR up and running. Uh, and on the next slide, I'll show you uh, briefly how MDBR works. Uh, so I like to call this a simplified version of how it works, but you have your, your workstation. Uh, in this case, it was a K-12 workstation that our marketing department wanted to call out. Uh, but your workstation tries to connect to badsite.com, of course, the greatest example you can think of. Uh, but prior to your server connecting to badsite.com, it's actually run through the Akamai database. And if Akamai sees that as malicious or even potentially malicious, the end user will be blocked from accessing that site. They'll get a, a, a web screen that says, hey, reach out to your IT department. Uh, this site may be malicious. And then from there, uh, your IT staff can review the site. And if it is malicious, that's great. You just stopped someone from accidentally clicking on a link uh, and making an incident occur on your network. And maybe it was something that wasn't malicious and we accidentally blocked it. Pick up the phone, call our security operations center and say, hey, uh, one of our end users just tried to reach goodsite.com and it got blocked. Do you mind whitelisting that for us? We'll have that done for you in a matter of minutes, hopefully not disturbing your business process too much. Uh, every week, those logs are sent to our security operations center and we send you a report every single Monday. Uh, and those reports are extremely detailed. You can use it uh, to see what types of connections were blocked, uh, what types of th threats they were, and how serious those threats were. Uh, and if I had a little bit more time, I would go into some stories, but uh, I want to talk about some of the other services that we do have to offer. Uh, and with that, I will go to the next slide, please. So this is one of uh, the other extremely important services that I'm going to talk about today, and it is our Cyber Incident Response Team. Uh, and I apologize for hesitating because they just changed their name and they love to change their name and, and not tell us on the outside. Uh, so our CERT is available to all of our members for incident response, malware analysis, and log analysis. Now this may seem repetitive with CISA, and that's okay. I like to say that we don't have to be the only organization that you work with, but we can be a second organization or maybe a third or a fifth. Uh, we don't do wholesale remediation, but as Rachel said, we have over 11,000 members. So something that you're seeing in New Jersey may have been happening in California the week prior. So we can give you those tips and recommendations to get through that incident. Next slide, please. Um, and with that, Maybe you wanna take an active approach on, on your malware analysis. And before incidents ever happen, you wanna analyze some of the, the executables that you're seeing. We actually have a malicious code analysis platform or MCAP, uh, a tool available to you, which is a virtual sandbox environment that you're able to upload any Word document, any URL, any PDF, pretty much any executable and MD, or MCAP will analyze that submission and let you know how malicious it was. It's a great way to take a proactive approach on cybersecurity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is where I'm gonna start talking pretty fast because I know I am coming up on time and I do wanna be conscious of the other speakers. Uh, our Secure Suite membership, this is where we host all of our CIS controls and CIS benchmarks. These are consensus built best, best practices and configuration guidelines that are available to you at no cost, whereas private industry pays upwards of $15,000 a year for it. Uh, and I will go right to the next slide too, please. And talk a little bit about some of the intelligence products that we do send. Uh, so on the screen, you can see a few examples of the emails that we send on a, on a regular basis, but there's two that I wanted to highlight. Uh, and the one main one is our Situational Awareness Report, or SAR. Uh, this is a monthly recap of all of the findings of the MSI SAC from the month prior. So if you ignore all of our emails, I ask you, please at least look at the, that situational awareness report because it gives you a great snapshot of all of, uh, all of the happenings from the month prior. Uh, and then the only other one that I wanted to highlight is our uh, monthly newsletter. Uh, and this is a great way to essentially steal our resources and and disperse it throughout your uh, organization. They're always extremely topical in nature. They come out once a month and they're able to be edited. Uh, 
Uh, so you can take it, rip our branding off of it and send it out to your employees as if you created it. And that's totally fine by us. The goal of that is to just spread cybersecurity awareness throughout the organization at an end user level. Uh, and then next slide, please. And that is, I promise this is one of my last ones. Uh, a quick snapshot of how to gain access to our resources. Of course, this presentation will be shared as well. Uh, so feel free to either take a picture or just grab them at a later date. Uh, and then next slide, please, where if you guys have any questions, we'll be happy to take them. Rachel and um, Brendan, that was great. Uh, I love the fact that you don't talk slow. I mean, we're on the East Coast here. You got to do that right now, right? So, okay, right. So, <laughs> let's get started with a couple of questions. One you already saw in chat, but I want to kind of uh, tweak it a little bit. So we know that a mm -hmm. lot of small agencies, um, especially police departments, boroughs, use managed service providers or they outsource it in some way. And as we understand it from your uh, discussion, these services are available only to public entities. Do I have that correct? So, so what would you say yes. to, um, well, we have a managed service provider, an IT service provider in our audience today who's saying, is there any way that there's a, an in-between? I'm, I'm working with a local PD, I'm their managed service provider, how can MSI SAC, or, or, or is that a hard no? No, absolutely reach out. Uh, we actually work with a few vendors throughout the entire country because we work with organizations of all size. Uh, so we work with IT staffs that are 50, 100 people at the state level. But then we also work with school districts, police departments, where they don't have dedicated IT staff. Uh, so vendors are allowed to work with us at a, at a slight a different level. Uh, there's a few more hoops to jump through. Uh, and the main one is all we need is an employee, a physical or an actual employee from the public entity to confirm that you do work with them. Uh, that's that's pretty much our baseline uh, and say as have them say that, yep, we do work with this managed security uh, vendor and they're OK to receive your materials on our behalf. And can they request services? Some of the things that you talked about, that's still possible. Yep, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. They okay. are still able to implement MDBR, MCAP, work with our CERT and our SOC. Okay, that's really important information because I know so many of our entities are small and don't have their own IT department, right? Okay. Um, this one from one of our university uh, participants. Um, is there available a clearinghouse of historical data available for all cybersecurity reported incidents into like Department of Homeland Security or New Jersey KIC? Um, and so for the state of New Jersey, I think really what um, our, our, our users asking is um, in terms of being educators, can we look at history? Can we, can we learn from what you've done for our agencies, some of these services that you've provided? Um, so I, I will answer that with a, a caveat. Uh, we do share some information on uh, cyber threats and incidents. However, we are extremely cognitive that these incidents are sensitive information. So we don't share any personal information. Uh, we never share an organization's name. Uh, and we never share that an organization had an incident unless they give us the explicit okay to do so. Um, that goes the same for anybody that's looking to become a member. Uh, that little bit of reassurance that we're not gonna share your information. Uh, we don't send it up to the feds. We don't send it to your state. Uh, it's all protected in house as well. Um, but that being said, you can reach out to us. We do have a little bit of history that we are able to share. Uh, and then one thing that we do actually fairly often is we connect uh, interested members with members that did experience an incident who are willing to share uh, about their experience in that in that field. Okay, great. I actually think that uh, I'll be hitting you up for some of that information. It's good for educational and, and background, right? Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to bring up a question that kind of merges from uh, what you talked about uh, earlier in our event. We asked people what were their greatest cyber challenges, right? What are the biggest challenges they're facing? And uh, number one was evolving cyber threats, and number two was staff awareness. So, um, you know, I'm a participant. I'm overwhelmed with all the really cool stuff that you just showed us. Or could you pick out? one service that you think is key for each of those challenges that, that would be the first go-to? 
Absolutely. And it's my favorite service and it's our malicious domain blocking and reporting service. Okay. Uh, the main goal of that is that it's super easy that to implement. Super easy to, it, it prevents those phishing emails from becoming an incident. So if one of your end users does accidentally click on a link because no matter how much training we push down their throats, somebody's going to make a mistake. And it, it just happens. It happens at our org, our organization happens at everywhere. Um, but MDBR can prevent those from becoming a major incident. Um, now, I feel like that's the one that's responding mostly to the cyber threats. What about staff awareness? Do you feel like there's a tool that we should be going as a go-to for that? Uh, so we do provide a few training resources. Uh, one that we didn't talk about during the presentation today, uh, partly because it's not ours, but uh, we talk about it a lot, is the Federal Virtual Training Environment. Uh, this is a great place to get completely free cybersecurity training. Uh, there's a, about 400 hours of courses on there, whether they're introduction to cybersecurity or training all the way up to your CISSP level. Uh, so they're meant for the end user as well as the cyber expert. Uh, the other resource that we do share is that monthly uh, that monthly newsletter. So it, it's meant to keep end users informed about the current cyber threats that are happening. Uh, for example, we are rapidly approaching holiday season, uh, and that's when all of our FedEx scams, our UPS scams start happening. Uh, so we release a newsletter every single year uh, related to those those types of scams. Uh, because everybody's wanted to know when their when their FedEx package is going to arrive or when their holiday present is going to arrive. So uh, we we provide those resources that you're able to share and actually pretty much steal from us and 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 make it as if it's your own and share to your end users. And it's I like to say if your grandma can still read, uh, she can read our newsletter and gain valuable information from it. I like it. Okay, um, I'm going to wrap us up. I just want to give Rachel a chance in case there was something you thought of while Brendan was was getting to the end of his thing. Um, Rachel, anything you want to add before we, we move on? Uh, no, I mean, he pretty much covered it. I also agree MDBR is the go-to. If there is one thing you're going to pick to start with your services, it's MDBR. Um, and again, just to reemphasize, everybody is welcome to utilize the info at msisec.org. Any questions, you know, even if you think uh, we definitely don't qualify, you know, or someone you know may not qualify, reach out to us because we're happy to help no matter what. Um, so cognizant of everyone else's time, you know, I think that wraps it up for us. But again, thank you for, for having us and allowing us to present. Great, thank you. It's such a friendly presentation. I feel I, most people would now take the, I mean, bite the bullet and, and come ask for help. So thank you for sharing with us today, Rachel and Brendan. Okay, so only 74% of you have had cybersecurity grant funding so far. So let me welcome Brian to talk a little bit more about that. So Department of Homeland Security in New Jersey, we've got our Grants Management Bureau, Brian During. Brian, it's all yours. Very good. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for having us here to present information on how you can best uh, apply for grant funding. And today's conversation is going to circle around this presentation that we provided already earlier in the year. It was a full hour, but we're going to give you the highlights today. Principally, we're going to speak about any grant funded projects that support the fight against terrorism. And uh, next slide, please. And so uh, what we're going to show you here is a map of New Jersey. We break it down into regions, uh, including the UASI region. And we speak to the funding that's available in New Jersey for terrorism related grants. And there are two funding streams. One is the UASI funding stream. The other is SHSP. And on the right side of the screen, you see those are the phases that we have also posted on our website. And we'll refer to that frequently. And in fact, the entire one hour presentation for how to obtain the grants and grant funding and all of the phases is available on our website. Next slide. So we speak about planning because planning is the most crucial element and every organization uh, is structured and participates in the planning efforts and our primary focus in the state of New Jersey 
is to utilize several planning governances that support the objectives. And our bottoms up approach involves state, county, local, and many times private groups. And we completely include all subject matter experts to nurture the relevant planning activities. Next slide. And this, this shows you highlights of the groups that are involved. The GMB staff is our grants management group. And we work for OHSP and we support and engage with the county, city, state governances. We prepare what's called our critical path. And you'll see that on our website. We participate in a process to form the Thyra and SPR and prepare the risk formula brief. And we conduct these, web, these uh, workshops. The website resources on the right-hand side are available on our website. And I would highly encourage anyone who wants to prepare a project proposal to review that information. Next slide, please. So with our engagement with the county, city, and state planning governances, we use a whole community approach. And the groups that are most crucial to our efforts are the county and city working groups. And if, you're, if you are interested in presenting a project proposal to our office, it should go through your county working group. If you don't know who that is, we have that information on our website. Um, but they principally are our point of contact for the SHSP funding. And if you have, uh, if you're within Uwasi region or an MSA county, and again, that's on our website, that uh, geographic region, you can apply through the Uwasi uh, executive committee as well. We have uh, another group that works closely with us, the Domestic Security Planning Task Force, also the Domestic Security Preparedness Planning Group, and those individual those groups review all of the state funded state level projects. And, uh, and Jay Kick is a principal partner there as well. And they are working hand in hand and certainly would uh, do the final review on any of the cyber related projects. Next slide, please. So the county working groups, and we'll focus on those because if you are anywhere a municipality or a locality or even some of the uh, uh, private partners, we, uh, we, would, we need you to go through the county working group. And so we em emphasize and include and encourage active involvement of a number of disciplines from within each county. And we also are currently uh, suggesting and restructuring the county working groups to include a cybersecurity representative from each county. Uh, but they essentially are convened. They act on the operational and procurement details of the programs. And their main purpose is to analyze, evaluate, prioritize, develop homeland security strategies and capability and preparedness gaps based on the needs and information they receive from all county, municipal, and private sector participants. Next slide. And here you see who uh, they are primarily comprised of, but as you can see on the slide, it's all disciplines. It's uh, many of your uh, largest population city representatives <clears throat> and domestic preparedness planners. But essentially those groups meet, we like it to be on a monthly basis, but certainly quarterly. And we have an expectation that the working groups are aware of the status of all projects, milestones, grant timelines. And again, those working groups, when they convene, as in, for instance, right now, they're currently convening to put together uh, the project proposals for any fiscal year 22 funding. Next slide. And as I mentioned earlier, this is our critical path. And the section that we're really talking about here are the green highlighted boxes, and that has to do with the planning phase. You can see in the first box, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but we've already started as of 7, 10, 21 to plan for FY uh, 22. And this covers the full three-year cycle 
of the performance period. <clears throat> Next slide. So there are a couple of caveats uh, when it comes to the uh, terrorism grant funding. Uh, first of all, 25% of your project needs to support law enforcement. So if you're asking for $100,000, $25,000 of that project needs to support law enforcement uh, activities. And that's not, a, not normally a heavy lift. And uh, certainly we can talk about that if you have uh, concerns. Um, but what we've seen, and one of the reasons that we wanted to be here today is a focus, an increased focus on national priorities from FEMA. In 2019, they started to move toward uh, looking at each individual investment area with uh, a, a greater uh, evaluation. And with that, they decided that cybersecurity should be a national priority, and it was not prior to 2019, and that you would be required to have a standalone project for each state. So as a state, we had one project, and the NJ Kick uh, managed the project. Then the following year, uh, there were actually further uh, and greater, more um, investment areas added. Uh, cybersecurity was retained, but the essential, um, uh, the essential thought is that FEMA is starting to become much more granular in how they approach the awards of these funds. And with that, we need to speak more clearly and have these projects aligned and get them done earlier. And so in 21, we see that there's actually a requirement now for 30% of all awarded funds in the state to be programmed toward these five national priority areas. Cybersecurity is, as you can see, leading the way, and 7.5% of all awarded funds have to, be, uh, have to be dedicated to a cybersecurity project or several. Uh, in the case of 21 and 20, uh, both those years, OHSP through the NJ Kick has been the lead to manage the projects that comprise those those funds, and those funds were approximately $2 million. Next slide. So here's, here's the highlights. The grant funding is limited. Uh, we've got about $2 million dedicated on an annual basis, uh, depending on national priorities that could change. But at the moment, that's what we're predicting for F FY22. Um, any of the state agency level project proposals need to be submitted through the OHSP Risk Management Bureau for scoring, and any of the local agency proposals would be submitted to the county working group. Uh, and then in addition to that, if you are awarded any funding, one of the FEMA requirements is that you complete the nationwide cybersecurity review. And again, I don't think that's a heavy lift. Um, most of all of our sub recipients have done so, and they've reported back to us that at most it takes them a couple of hours. Next slide, please. And so we end, but um, what, we're, what we're really looking to do is just uh, offer you these, this very general thumbnail presentation on what it takes to plan and uh, our availability to assist you with any of your efforts. And with that, we'll turn it over to any questions. Thank you, Brian. Sorry, I was on mute there for a minute. Well, the first question that came up was, do you see the set aside increasing in the future for cyber to more than 7.5%? So we're constantly surprised by uh, the releases uh, from FEMA, but our planning efforts are typically based on previous year's awards. So for FY22, uh, we're going to go with the 7.5% number and make adjustments as necessary. If we find out as we typically do sometime around uh, March or so, that there's our adjustments needed. Okay. Um, so here's another question. How would somebody contact their county working group? Um, so we have on our website, 
uh, under the grants resources, a list of county working group points of contact. Uh, if anyone has any issue with that, certainly they could contact me as well, but we have it there for them. And just as a, a looking ahead, number four in your, your four step was if you get the funding, you have to participate in the nas nationwide cybersecurity review. Can you give us a bird's eye view of what that might entail? Well, it's essentially uh, physical and cybersecurity. Uh, we found that people have to incorporate uh, both their IT folks and some buildings and grounds people typically. Sometimes OEM gets involved too. But again, like I said, it's kind of a, it's just a, a pulse check essentially. And I guess year over year, it gives you a good idea too. I know uh, Jennifer Pollan and, and Mike are a bit more aware of it. Well, that's actually a good segue. Thank you, Brian. I'm going to bring it over to Mike now, and we'll see if we have any more questions as we come back. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us today. Okay, back to our agenda. Uh, I'd like to welcome to the stage um, Director Mike Garrity, Director of the New Jersey Kick, and he's bringing up his own slideshow. Um, handing it over to you, Mike. Okay, thank you, and thanks, Mandy. Thanks, Brian. Um, and, and thanks to everybody, Rachel and, and, and Brendan and Tony. And, and I really wanted to get these folks in front of everybody from New Jersey. Brian mentioned we're coming up into the grant proposal see, season and, and, and we wanted to know what's out there already rather than applying for a grant for something that you can already get for free. And I'm gonna say this, the, the NJ Kick, um, we have a, a finite budget, we have finite resources, whether they be grant or they st state share or, or you know, direct state funding and stuff like that. However, that being said, um, we take advantage of all of those services that Tony mentioned from CISA, that the MSI SAC mentioned, and, and um, they're invaluable because it allows us to take those finite resources and apply them elsewhere instead of duplicating things. Um, Brendan and Rachel focused on the MDBR, and and I'm, I'm a gigantic fan of that. You know, it's basically web filtering so that people on your network don't visit malicious sites. And if you think of phishing emails and the links that are included in them, well, the MDBR is going to block those. And why would you pay for something that's already being provided for free? and really, really effective. And, and so things like that, the, the penetration tests, the, the uh, scans of the networks. We have CISA doing scans of our state network on a weekly basis. We get reports every Monday morning from every IP address that we have on whether there's any found vulnerabilities. That provides a situational awareness and allows us to obviously go and remediate those vulnerabilities. Again, that's a service that's provided for free that costs a lot of money, you know, especially on big networks, the web application scanning, those types of things are, are just so invaluable. So, you know, whether it is, you know, MSI SAC CISA or some of the services that we provide here in the NJ Kick, and, and some of them are overlapping, but that's fine. We believe in defense and depth in cybersecurity. Um, so it's a whole of nation, whole of society type of approach to cybersecurity when we involve CISA and the FBI and MSI SAC and all our other partners out there. Um, so, you know, just think of all the different things. And, and Brian mentioned some of the funding that's available through the Homeland Security grants and, and the like. There's more grants coming out. I know um, the infrastructure bill is going through Congress. It's that one trillion dollar bill. Um, there's about a billion dollars in there for cybersecurity to state and local governments. Um, so we'll see where that goes and stuff. It's going to be over a five year period. Um, but you know, more and more of that funding is coming out and, and, and we'll, we'll go from there. So um, Brian mentioned the Domestic Security uh, Task Force and, and uh, the Domestic Security Preparedness Act, which is really what you know, is the genesis for um, the organization of, of the Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness here in New Jersey. Obviously, after the terrorist attacks in 2001, um, the Domestic Security Preparedness Act was, was passed and it, it, to make New Jersey, um, you know, preserve, protect, and sustain domestic security. And whether that's terrorism, whether that's preparedness for things like Hurricane Sandy, and more recently, cybersecurity. 
And so as part of that, there's a domestic security preparedness task force that meets on a monthly basis by and large. Um, and we deal with things that at the state level, emergencies that are happening, where, whether they be COVID or other uh, security issues at that level. And one of the things that we did this past year is we put together a cybersecurity strategic plan. It was ratified by the, uh, the Domestic Security Task Force back in September. Uh, the plan is for the years 21 through 25. Um, there's three top level strategic goals. Um, one is, is to provide cybersecurity leadership. And if you look at the mission of the NJ Kick or look at the mission for OHSP, it's to lead and coordinate our cybersecurity efforts here in New Jersey. And when we do that, we take it as a whole of state approach. And, and, and the reason for that is, unlike some of the other terrorism issues and, and um, crime issues, there are no borders and there's no geography in cybersecurity. There's no time. Um, time and distance are irrelevant. So we can't say this county is more important than that county um, because there are no distances, you know, um, and, and there's no geography, if you will. So we take this whole of state approach, but also, you know, engaging with partners um, like CISA, like MSI SAC on a whole of nation approach and whole of society approach, because we even deal with the overseas folks. Um, the second strategic goal is capability building. It's increasing the resilience of both our public and private sector institutions, the critical infrastructure assets, the key resources, and the citizens of New Jersey. So even those that just are using their iPads to watch YouTube or, or Netflix or whatever, um, they're using computers more and more. Um, the attack surface is expanding more and more, and we're depending on um, computer and network technologies for all aspects of you know, work and, and life. And, and so being able to build capabilities to increase that resilience. And um, the third strategic goal that we have is this partnerships and collaboration. And, and you know, we see that today. We've got a lot of our partners on here. Um, we've got you know, CISA, we've got MSI SAC, we partner with the FBI. It was up at NJ Transit last week. Um, we've got partners all over the world that are helping us with this. And that's the only way that we're going to get it done. So cultivating those strategic partnerships um, pervasively with the public and private sector organizations. On a monthly basis, I meet with the, the CISOs for the, the heads of the utilities in the state of New Jersey, the energy and water utilities, to make sure their cybersecurity stuff is up to snuff. We share information, we have that partnership, and we do so at the university level as well. I know Stan is on here. We work with Stan up at Keen University on a number of, of um, events and, and things that we've done, and we've done um, some events up there and conferences at Keene. Uh, we also work with NGIT and Rutgers and, and Glassboro and Rowan and, and everybody else. Um, anyone and everybody that wants to partner with us, we're pervasively out there trying to collaborate and partner as well so that we can build that whole of state approach and whole of nation approach, if you will. So um, Brian mentioned some of the uh, cybersecurity grant opportunities. Um, Regardless of, of, you know, we hear the word grant and it becomes, you know, hunger games for everybody that wants some money and stuff like that. Um, but as we approach cybersecurity grants in the NJ kick and, and uh, we again take that whole of state approach uh, to buy, you know, seven licenses for Windows 10 for somebody that did an upgrade from Windows 7 when it went out of date and or out of support in January. 2020 is not a great approach to cybersecurity. It, it protects those seven systems, maybe, um, but the fact that they weren't upgraded probably tells you everything you need to know about how those systems were managed in the first place. I'm not sure that putting a new operating system um, is, is going to help that much with them. Um, so the, our whole of state approach here, um, one is to create what I call the NJ Sutton, New Jersey Cyber Corps. Okay. It's really a cybersecurity emergency response team, and it provides asset response training and equipment. So what we want to get um, is our people trained in you know, a, a few of them in each of the counties so that we have a cadre of individuals 
that can provide cybersecurity incident response, whether it's at a, a, a municipal level, a county level, or even the private sector level. Providing that training and equipment, and we've done a number of the trainings already, whether it be SANS, CompTIA, um, plural site uh, subscriptions and classes are coming up. Um, and this is how we're spending the money uh, that, that we get for, for grants in, in New Jersey. Um, also, uh, that will actually launch in, in uh, October of this year is our first New Jersey cyber range. So if you think of a cyber range, it's a hands-on experiential learning on how to defend and how to attack. Um, and so this is something that I think is really important because while the classes are great and the classes may provide you hands-on for that week that you're in class, the cyber range will allow you to continue to build that muscle memory um, as you defend against attacks and how you respond to attacks and those types of things. And I'm really excited about being able to offer this. And it's gonna be offered at every level, whether it's your local, whether you're a county, whether you're a state organization. And we even wanna try and get private sector to some degree um, using it so that they can practice. Again, that whole of state approach. Cybersecurity, threat intelligence and information sharing. Um, we provide a lot of that even without the grant funding. So those bulletins that you get, the alerts, the advisories, all of that stuff that we send out, um, you know, and, and all that information that we provide, that's part and parcel of the NJ kick that's state funded. Um, that's not coming out of the grants, but we do provide and will be providing more and more intelligence and information from various sources, open and closed sources of information like the dark web and pace sites and all these other things um, where criminal activities are terrorist activities occur. Um, one of the programs that we um, launched back in May of 2020 is the Compromised Credentials Program. We call it the You Have Been Pawned Program. And essentially what we're doing is scraping from the dark web compromised credentials for uh, public sector organizations here in New Jersey, whether you're a school system, school district, law enforcement agency, municipality, county, or state agency, if your email address associated with your work is out there on the dark web, along with, a, with the, the password that's been compromised, what we're doing is notifying those organizations. Since May of 2020, we've done over 19,000 notifications of compromised credentials. Um, so these are credentials that may be used to log into public sector networks here in New Jersey or public sector accounts somewhere um, in, you know, that you use and stuff. Vulnerabilities and risky services are another thing um, that we provide and will be providing more and more of. Um, if we go back to uh, the March of this past year, uh, the exchange vulnerabilities with Hafnium um, threat group over in China, uh, where there were a bunch of you know uh, attacks and exploits against them. What we went out find out all the different systems in New Jersey that were vulnerable to this, and then we made about 180 or so different notifications to those organizations to make sure that they could take. The, the right steps to remediate the vulnerabilities and also to find out if they, they may have been compromised already and all the other steps to take to um, remediate that issue as well. And then we've got some risk management services. When you become a member of the NJ Kick, and remember everything that we provide for, for from the NJ Kick is free as well. It's your tax dollars at work. And then Tony said that um, with CISA. Um, being able to provide you with a scorecard on what your organization looks like from the outside in the eyes of a hacker. So if you've got vulnerabilities out there, um, if you haven't patched systems, if you've got you know, outdated operating systems and things, this is what the bad guys are looking for. And these are the things that they're going to attack. So what we want to do is provide that information to you so that not only providing it to you, but ways to resolve some of the stuff that's going on um, and some of the stuff that you're exposing. So um, that we want to expand on. Uh, we've been doing the cybersecurity program controls assessment, which is basically a risk assessment, um, a self-assessment, if you will. Um, on, the, on the topic of self-assessments, Brian mentioned the NCSR, the National Cybersecurity Review. 
Um, and this is a pro program that's run out of the MSI stack and it's free. And simply you go to the MSI SAC site, you sign up for the NCSR, and it's basically a self-assessment for cybersecurity for your organization. Now it's a requirement to apply for any of these Homeland Security grants. If you are part of state government in New Jersey, and I know we've got a number of state government um, uh, employees and, and, and representatives on the line, we fill this out for the entire state government, okay? But if you're from a county or a municipality or some other organization in, in the public sector in New Jersey, um, you're going to need to fill out the NCSR in order to apply for a grant. Um, we, we have something called the New Jersey Statewide Cybersecurity Threat Grid. Um, and this has been up, and this is one of those first projects that Brian mentioned that after funding came available, it's a 24 by seven network intrusion detection services system. And essentially it's an intrusion detection system put on the perimeter of um, 15 county networks, two major city networks, um, the Garden State Network, which is the state government network, and the elections network for the state of New Jersey. And it's monitored 24 seven by the MSI SAC. Okay, and, and so some of the stuff Brendan was talking about, um, they're helping us protect the state of New Jersey by, by providing that monitoring service. Um, and then the last thing here that I have listed is the Cyber Terrorism Task Force. And that's actually run by the, the New Jersey State Police Cyber Crimes Unit. Again, this is training and equipment, but on the threat re response side. So Tony mentioned asset response. I have asset response and threat response. The difference here is asset response like us and CISA provides is the prevention, detection, um, containment, eradication, and remediation of cyber incidents, whereas the threat response is that law enforcement criminal investigation aspect. They're taking out the threat actor, if you will. So different, you know, we, we don't do threat response here in the, in the NJ kick, but the, we work with our partners both at the state level in the state police and at the federal level with the FBI for that threat response and also at the local and county level as well. So those are, um, you know, how the money is being spent today. And this is, you know, again, that whole of state approach. Um, as they say, a, a rising tide will, you know, float all boats or raise all boats. Um, that's what we're trying to do rather than these individual small grants where we spend more time administering and, and putting resources into the administration um, rather than actually um, providing any type of service. So with that, I'll take any questions anybody has. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, we seem to have answered most people's questions. Director Garrity, is there any last thoughts before we thank our speakers? Well, I want to say thank you to you, Mandy, and, and, and the NJ Kick team for setting this up. I want to thank all the participants for participating and attending. And, you know, whether it's us in the NJ Kick or the MSI SAC or CISA, you've got three sets of public servants here that are at your service. And Tony mentioned it earlier. We're from the government, um, we're here to help, and, and we absolutely mean that when we say that. Um, we are not regulatory agencies, we're here to help you. So if there's anything that we can do, please don't hesitate to reach out, and there's lots of ways to reach out you know, for any of the organizations. Um, as we've said a few times, we're recording the session, um, the session and all those resources will be available on our website afterwards. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for coming today. We appreciate all your attendees who took the time from your summer. We really appreciate our speakers for spending the time with us and we'll be bringing more resources to you. So keep an eye on your New Jersey Kick membership. Um, thank you again for joining us today.